Hey everybody, it's Lon Seidman. I know many of you walk around with one of those big power banks to keep your devices charged up, but what if your phone was also a power bank? And that's what I've got here, another quirky phone from Unihertz. Now this company is known for making really small phones, and this one is really big. It is large and in charge because it incorporates a 22,000 milliamp hour battery along with a smartphone and it's very ruggedly designed to survive when you're out in the field with it. It's waterproof and drop proof and all the other things you can think of here. And we're going to take a closer look at this phone and see what it's all about in just a second. But I do want to let you know in the interest of full disclosure that this came in free of charge from Unihertz. However, they are not paying for this review, nor are they reviewing or approving what you're about to see before it was uploaded. And all the opinions you're about to hear are my own. So let's get into it now and see what this big and heavy phone is all about. Now, the price point on this comes in at around $400. This is compatible with Verizon here in the U.S. along with T-Mobile. It does not work at the moment with AT&T. It is 4G only, and on Verizon, you do need to activate your SIM card on another phone and then transfer it over to this one to get it to work. Uh, but once you're uh, activated there, you should be good to go. So a little more uh, tweaking to get everything up and running with these Unihertz phones. Now, this has a 6.81-inch display. It is running at 2340 by 1080, so effectively a 1080p display. It is a standard LED, nothing fancy like an OLED or anything, but it looks good enough, I think, for what it is. Uh, it's adequately bright for outdoor usage, and overall it seems like it's fine for uh, what you're getting here. Inside it has a MediaTek Helio G99 processor, not the fastest thing in the world as you'll see in a few minutes. It is running Android 12, and Unihertz has been relatively good about keeping these phones up to date. This one's had two updates already. It has 8 gigabytes of RAM and 256 gigabytes of UFS 2.2 storage, but it does not support SD cards, so the internal storage is all that you're going to get on this one, but 256 gigs feels pretty good. As I mentioned, it has a large 22,000 milliamp hour battery, it will go for a very long time. I think I charged this thing up once when I got it initially, and I haven't charged it since. And I think I'm on like day three or four of using the phone. Now, I haven't been gaming on it or anything crazy like that, but still the uh, battery here is going to last significantly longer than it might on other devices. Now to charge the battery quickly, they give you a 66 watt power adapter in the box. This is typically the power adapter you'd find with a mid-level laptop. And I found in my testing, when I drained the battery out of the phone, uh, we were able to get it to charge at around 50 watts or so. So it will charge up pretty quickly here, provided you have the right power adapter hooked up to it. And one of the things that I discovered about this, though, is that not every one of these USB-C power delivery chargers works with it. Unihertz tells me that the adapter that you're using has to support PPS in order to get the full power output. I believe this is part of the PD standard, but I have a bunch of these PD power adapters hanging around the house here. And in my testing, the only one that worked at the full uh, power level there was the one it came with. So just be aware of that. You may not want to lose this because I found that a lot of the other power adapters that apparently didn't support PPS charged the phone very slowly. Now the tank does work as a power bank. You're not gonna get very fast charging out of it, but it will charge your devices. So if you plug in, a USB-C cable to the USB-C port on the phone here and then attach another device, in this case my iPhone. Uh, what you will see here is that my iPhone uh, will begin charging off of the tank phone here. So you can use its battery just to operate the phone or charge other things with it. Now, as you're looking at this thing, you might say it must be pretty heavy. Well, it certainly is. It comes in at 1.2 pounds or 560 grams. It definitely lives up to its moniker, both in its battery capacity and its girth and weight. Uh, but they do uh, pack a good amount into this thing. Now on the left-hand side here, you have two programmable buttons. And these buttons can be programmed to do all sorts of different things on the phone. Uh, so for example, I could have it take a picture with a single button push. I can also have it react to a double push and I can also have it do something else when I hold the button down. You can basically have these buttons do whatever you want here on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, you have a fingerprint reader along with your volume rocker buttons, and this button here also doubles as your power switch. 
Uh, for biometrics, you can do a face recognition off the front camera, or you can use the fingerprint sensor, or configure both depending on what your situation is. So lots of options for getting into it. Now, like many Unihertz phones, this is super rugged and waterproof. It is IP68 rated, although you're gonna wanna make sure that you've got all of your ports covered up by the gaskets here. Uh, we saw that USB-C port a minute ago when we charged up the phone. That's on the bottom here. Uh, that will, of course, charge other devices. This is also where you plug the power supply in to charge the phone itself. And, of course, this supports OTG as well with other USB devices. You have a headphone jack here at the bottom, which is always good to see on phones these days. The screen comes with a screen protector pre-installed on it, so you do have some protection on the glass out of the gate here. On the top is where your SIM cards go, and it will support two nano SIMs, so you can run this on two networks simultaneously. Now the back is where things get rather interesting. Uh, what we've got here on the uh, back is a very large camping lantern, they call this. It is a super bright light. And how bright is it? Well, take a look at this. I've got a back room in my basement here that can be pitch black when you close the door. And this is what it looks like after I turn the light on. It's a 1200 lumen lamp. It is so bright that before you turn it on, you get a warning from their uh, application here about irradiating your eyes. Let me go back into the toolbox here where this lives. So if we jump in here and go to camping lamp, you'll get this warning here that says it will irradiate your eyes. And what you do is just go over here to full bright and that will uh, activate the light here. And as you can see, it is blinding in its brightness here. You also have a half bright and a slightly bright setting and you can also have it blink and do other things to alert people to a potential issue that you might have found yourself into. So a nice little survival lamp built into this. Now on the back, you've got your camera section. And in addition to the very bright camping lantern here, you also have a more traditional smartphone flash. And this can also be used as a light. So if you don't need something as bright as this, you can turn this on instead. You'll notice down here, there are two little LEDs. These are infrared light emitters. And this is used with its camera here on the back that is a night vision camera. Now, unfortunately, the night vision quality out of this is not good in a dark environment. Uh, this is that same room we were looking at earlier. And as you can see, the camera has uh, problems focusing. The image is not very clear. And it looks as though there's some dirt or grime inside of the lens. And it could just be that this early release review unit had a quality issue, but overall I wasn't pleased with the night vision performance on this one when you're in a fully dark environment. Now the night vision camera has a 20 megapixel sensor and it does video at 1080p at 30 frames per second. I did take some stills with this. They did not look much better than the video you just saw, so I was pretty disappointed with that camera. The middle camera I was also disappointed with. This is supposedly a 108 megapixel AI camera and it makes very big photos that would make you think you're getting a super high quality image here. As you can see, my largest one is 30 megabytes. The average is in the 20 megabyte territory and these are the JPEGs. Um, but when you dive into these images, they don't look all that great when you start zooming in for more detail. So here's a photo I took in New York City the other day. We've got decent light here. Typically when you've got a sensor that's supposedly north of 100 megapixels, you can zoom in and still maintain detail when you're looking at the photo, not here, check it out. We're gonna go in a little bit further here and you can see just how soft the details are as we're zooming in. And this is probably a function of the fact that it doesn't have very good optics on its lenses uh, and also because the sensor is very small physically. So the number of megapixels doesn't always translate into a high quality image. I would wager that you could probably take a similar picture on a Samsung or Apple phone with far less resolution and get better quality than this. So not all that great on the photo side, but certainly uh, better than perhaps some of the other cheap Unihertz phones we've looked at in the past. And I suspect that it's not really 108 megapixels, but they might be doing some interpolation to bring it up. And the reason why I suspect that is because the maximum video resolution this will do is 1440p at 60 frames per second. And the video quality, as you can see, is not all that great here either. I did enable the electronic image stabilization, but as you can see, it's still pretty rough here from a video standpoint. 
And I don't think people buy these Unihertz phones for their cameras, and uh, certainly this one is a little better than some of their other ones, but still not great, and nowhere near the uh, level of quality you'll get out of a name brand phone. Now, the last of the three cameras on the back is their macro camera. This one is only two megapixels, but you can position something about four centimeters from the lens and get a pretty sharp image out of it. So you can see this USB connector is something I took a picture of a few minutes ago. And it looks okay, but just not a ton of resolution there. Now they say the front camera here is a 32 megapixel camera, but I did not see very good image quality out of it. Here I took a couple of selfies. You can see that I am out of focus and the back doesn't look much better there. Uh, if we go to a few other ones here, you can see it had similar issues focusing on me. What's interesting is that it detected my face after I pushed the shutter button and then it would uh, lose me again. So I was not able to get a sharp photo. And as you can see, as I zoom in here, everything is really soft, even in the areas that are in focus. I took another still life photo here just to give you a sense of that. And under good studio lights here, you can see that everything is kind of grainy and soft. So I think they're doing some of that interpolation on this as well. It will do 1080p 30 frames per second video out of the front. And as you can see, it doesn't stabilize very well and the quality isn't all that great either there. So all in, like other Unihertz phones, not a great camera system, but better than nothing. But I suspect people that buy these phones buy them for reasons other than photography. They do have some utility to them, especially if you are out in the field. So I would not be looking at this for its cameras, but maybe perhaps uh, for its ruggedness. Now, as far as performance goes, it feels like a run-of-the-mill Android phone. There's really nothing to complain about there. It does everything that you'd want an Android phone to do. So we can pop into the web browser here and visit my favorite website, nasa.gov, and see how quickly that loads up. Uh, no problems. We're on my local Wi-Fi, of course, but everything seems to render in quickly here, and it's relatively responsive there. Uh, we can also take a look at YouTube and pull up one of my videos here and see how that does. Of course, we got to get through the ad here first. We got to pay the bills, right? Um, but beyond that, I think the performance here should be adequate for, I think, what most people are looking for a phone to do, at least at this price point. So nothing to complain about on the performance end. Let's take a look at what kind of games we can play on this. So here is Goat Simulator, kind of a little 3D sandbox game. And this works fine on here. I think most of the Android game library targets phones at around this performance level. So I don't think you'll have any issues playing Genshin Impact and Call of Duty Mobile and some of the other popular games out there. You may not be able to get the full uh, quality visuals out of it, but it should do fine. As far as emulation goes, I think you're going to be stuck with mostly the 8 and 16-bit era. Uh, these processors are not quite enough to do the GameCube and a few of the more advanced emulators that are out there, but uh, overall, I think for casual gaming, it's fine. The phone is so heavy that it's not going to be very comfortable as a gaming platform. And of course, it is much too large and heavy to use with any of those controller add-ons you might find from Razer and other companies. So this is certainly not much of a gaming device, but if you did want to play a little uh, goat simulator and do a workout at the same time with the weight here, I think you can make that happen. And on the 3D Mark Wildlife Benchmark Test, we got a score of 1,337, and that performance is about what I expected out of its MediaTek processor. Nothing spectacular here, but I don't think this is a phone that people buy for its performance. They buy it for its utility. And the target market with this are people that are going outdoors and want long battery life along with some utility out of their phone. And what's neat about this is that this replaces three things people might carry with them. A bright lantern, a power bank, and a phone. It's all integrated here into one device. And this thing is rugged enough and waterproof enough to survive a camping trip or something more extreme than that. So I think there's a very limited audience for this, but that's one of the things that I love about Unihertz is that they make phones for these tiny slivers of the marketplace, and they're very creative in every phone they come up with. I don't think we've seen a phone that was kind of a normal phone from them. They really look for these little niches they can find a way into, and they usually find some people willing to buy them enough to keep their company afloat and, of course, keep the new devices coming along. And I've got another one coming in soon, so we'll have another neat phone to take a look at from Unihertz. And I'm always excited to look at these because it is fun to see something new and different 
in the smartphone world. That is going to do it for now. Until next time, this is Lon Seibin. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters, including Gold Level supporters Brian Parker, Chris Allegretta, Hot Sauce and Video Games, Logic AGR, Tom Albrecht, and Amda Brown. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.